can see him is about how we can, some of the ways we develop an image of the Lord in our minds.
Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Amen. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Lord, you came upon earth so that we may have life, that we may have freedom, that we may know love. Show us today, Lord, in your word, how to love one another as you have loved us. Crack open our hearts a little bit more each day as we get closer to your birth. And may our eyes be enlightened and may we see more brightly your vision of what life can be like as we follow you. Thank you, Lord, for all your blessings and all your gifts. Amen. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. O Lord, forgive us our trespasses. Amen. You're all invited to be seated, and children, you are welcome to come up for your talk. All right. I know. Isn't that great? Yep. So when you see this, what does it make you think of at Christmas time? And shepherds. A shepherds, right? Yep. And some of you are going to be portraying shepherds in our tableau, right? I'm portraying a shepherd. <laughs> you are too. Yep. My grandma's going to do a Wonderful. So that's exciting. So today I want to read a little bit of the shepherd story to you and think about what that story teaches us about how to love each other. Have you thought about that? Why the Lord came to the shore? An angel appeared to the shepherds of all people in the world. Why would he choose them? No. no. Okay. Well, let's think about that a little bit today. Because what is shepherd's job? Do you know what a shepherd does? It guards sheep. Right. It protects the sheep. Right? So you can imagine, have you ever driven by a field or walked by a field and seen sheep or lambs out inside it? Okay, well, in this case, we're going to think about sheep, okay? We're thinking about sheep out in the field, and there is someone who protects them, and that person is called a shepherd. So the shepherd leads them to water so they can drink. He leads them to green grass so they can eat, right? And he keeps them safe from what are called predators. You know what a predator is? That's a big word. Yep. What do you think? Something that would kill them. Right. Or something that would kill them or eat them, Right. So maybe a wolf or a lion or something like that. So, so part of the job of the shepherd having this stick, this crook or staff, is what do you think a shepherd can do with this? Right, can fight them off. Another thing is you can see this. It's usually pretty tall, so you could see it if you were looking. Where is the shepherd? Well, oh, there's the stick. So I can see it because it's up in the, maybe get a taller one than that, right? I don't know. This is a special one that's from Cody's family, right? Is it yours, Dick? Yeah. Yours? Okay. Thank you for sharing it with us. All right, so let's read this story. Now, you know, after Jesus was born, this is what we hear. It says, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone before around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. 
So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste, which is quickly, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. Amen. So what did you hear in that story? Anything that you noticed about the story that was interesting? Yeah? Is that the first time you heard that story? Probably not. Probably not. Okay. Well, the angel appeared to the shepherds and told them a special message that the Lord was born on earth and they would find him lying in a manger. Do you know what a manger is? You do. Well, a manger is a place where animals come and feed, right? So there might be uh, hay in this little box where you, they, man, they would come and they would eat food there. And they lay, wrapped up the Lord in swaddling clothes tightly and put him in the manger. And they would know that that is who the Lord was. And they came and they were so amazed by it, they did something. They told everybody about it. Ew, wonderful. So you open it every day and learn something about it? I read my whole beginning. Okay. Well, one of the things I want you to think about today as we think about the shepherd story is remember that the shepherds protect, right? And they defend the sheep. And that's something very important. And what you would think about as we look around us and we see people in the world, we can think about how can I be like a shepherd and protect them, help them to be safe. We would that is true. The Lord is the shepherd and we are his sheep. And he also inspires us and asks us to care for each other and love each other, right? So maybe if you see someone who's not safe or someone who might be in, har in harm's way, you could go and help them out, right? Or say something or tell somebody about it, right? What are ways that we can love each other and protect each other is the question we think about. So today, the church is doing something wonderful, which is a lot of people are coming to the church today to receive they may not have a lot of money or a lot of resources, and they're going to be able to come and get gifts and give them to their families where they may not be able to buy them. So a lot of people have given gifts so they can do that. And that's one way we can love one another, right, is do things, kind things like that. So today, I don't know if you know this, but um, tell me if you know what this is. Okay. All right. So you know what that is. That's good. So, do you know why we have candy canes at Christmas time? Why? why? Because they taste good. They taste good. All right. That's a good answer. They're also minty. They're minty. Yep. Very good. And what do you they think? Yep. And they go on our food. Well, do you know that a shepherd's staff looks like this? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Ah. This one doesn't, but usually they have a little hook on the end so they can grab maybe a, a lamb that's fallen down, or they can hook it around the neck because the bill's too small, and help pull it up. So this can remind us at Christmas time of how we are going to try to be like shepherds ourselves and help other people. So well, you're going to see these around at Christmas time, aren't you? Mm -hmm. And you're going to see one right now because I can give you one. And I, don't, I don't want a candy cane. I have that's fine. You don't have to have a candy cane, but if you'd like one, you can help yourself to one. And I want you to think about what it means when you see them, okay? That we can help. Does that one care if I get some for my family? Well, let's wait and make sure we have enough for all the, the children that are coming up, okay? And if so, then sure thing. All right. We got more, more interest when there's candy canes. Very good. All right. We got the last one. Oh, there's an extra one. <laughs> All right, thank you for listening. Let's sing our next song.
Our next song is also a handout, and it's Once in Royal David City. Please stand and sing with us. Freely we have received, freely we give. I want you to bow your heads for a blessing on the children. May the Lord give his angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. Amen. I'd like to invite the teens and the children to go to their programs while we sing our next song. So, o Little Town of Bethlehem on page 53.
Next reading will be shared by Freya Henry. From the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife, and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Thank you. And our final reading for today is from the Heavenly Doctrines for the New Church. This is from a work called Secrets of Heaven. When the Lord was in the world, he had no other life than the life of love for the entire human race, which he felt a burning desire to save forever. That vital energy is the very truest heavenly life, and through it, he united himself to his divinity and his divinity to himself. His central being, or Jehovah, is nothing but mercy, the product of love for the whole human race. And his life was one of pure love, which is utterly impossible for any human. In all of his spiritual trials, the Lord never looked for any prize of victory for himself. His prize of victory was the salvation of the whole human race. It was out of love toward the human race, whole human race, that he fought. When anyone fights out of that love, he or she demands no prize for him or herself. The reason is that that love wishes to give away and impart to others all that is its own and to have nothing for itself. Amen. And our lessons, and blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. Amen.
Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So Christmas is drawing closer, and I wonder if that strikes you with excitement or fear. Or you find yourself busy or stressed at this time. Because I think it can feel like the one opportunity of the year to really be touched by love, to see the light, to be hopeful, to find peace and joy within ourselves, to feel close to our loved ones, and to find family togetherness, hopefully, and to be inspired. There's so many stories about this time of year that we probably either watch as movies or read that talk about having change of hearts and being inspired. Think about Christmas Carol and Ebenezer Scrooge and what if we could have that same sort of change within ourselves from being miserly to becoming generous of heart. Can that be true? We think about the Grinch and his tiny little heart and his attitude and how his heart grew three sizes when he knew what the real meaning of Christmas was. Think about a wonderful life, or it's a wonderful life and George Bailey, sort of going through the motions of life and having an experience where he could really come to appreciate that he had been given a wonderful gift, that life is wonderful. And I think of Charlie Brown and his simple way of seeing the world and feeling like something's missing, but finally when Linus shares with him the story of the Lord's birth, that he finally understands the true meaning of Christmas. So I feel like there's pressure to feel the love, to make sure we don't miss it somehow, that the season doesn't pass us by, and we don't really know what happened. And yes, we're talking about something that we might call miraculous that can take place inside of each of us, because the Lord's way is a way that imagines and plans for us something so much greater than we could possibly imagine and plan for ourselves, or even create for ourselves. We may think of what might make us happy or what might make us feel good, and we might say, well, if I could have success in, in school or could have success in my business. And that's great, but it's not the, the same kind of a deep joy that the Lord can give us. Or maybe we want to be famous or well-known or well-regarded by other people. And that might be cool, but it, it's really shallow in comparison to what the Lord can offer. Or maybe we crave wealth and an ability to buy whatever it is that we want. And that would be delightful, but it wouldn't be lasting. What we're hoping for is something eternal, a lasting sense of hope, a lasting feeling of love, a deep feeling of joy and peace. Some of the words that are used in Scripture to talk about what the Lord, the message that the Lord is bringing is gladness being blessed, good news, <clears throat> good news, being filled with good things, being rescued, to be able to serve without fear, to have great joy, to have peace, to have light. So what I'd like to do this morning is look at some of the messages that we can glean from the Christmas story to maybe take home some of those lessons of love and peace in our life and how maybe we can create a place of love within our own lives, and so that place can grow. Well, actually, create a place where the Lord can help it to grow within us. So we can feel those good tidings of great joy, which are promised to all. Because it's really, if you ask someone, if someone asked you, could you describe the feeling of Christmas? You say, well, it I feels good, <laughs> feels can feel wonderful. It's kind of like trying to explain what love is. It's hard to put it to words, but you kind of know it when you feel it. So I start with thinking about God's love for us. The writings for the New Church use this phrase to describe it. It says, God's love is unbelievable in the extreme. Not just unbelievable, but it's unbelievable in the extreme, which is hard to really figure what that means, but it's really hard for us to get a sense of how much the Lord truly loves each one of us. He created each one of us because he loves us. He wants to be with us. He wants to be conjoined with us. And he wants to make us happy 
from himself. That's his nature. That's what the Lord wants for us. He loves us so much that he was willing to come on earth, take on our frail human form so that he could restore our freedom, so that we could be free to experience his love and the joy of being human. Because in time, the human race turned away in the freedom that the Lord gave them. And we know what that's like. We've been, all been given freedom, and sometimes we make bad choices, right? We make choices in freedom, and we turn away, and we think, well, this is the right thing for me to do. I know it doesn't sound right according to what I know to be right, but I just feel like it's right, so I'm going to do it. And we realize that we create a type of hell for ourselves. But the Lord wants to pull us out of that and can pull us out of that. And he did that for the whole human race. It said about the human race that there was this impending damnation at the door unless the Lord had come and restored our freedom. Because that freedom was almost lost. Can you imagine that not being able to actually be free to choose anything that was good for yourself or to understand what was true? It was almost to that point where the freedom was completely lost. But he came himself to be with us, to endure a life that from beginning to end was fraught with attacks from the hells, all of them. Every hell that you have ever experienced in your own life or anyone has ever experienced. And some of you could probably talk intimately about what that is like and how hard that is. But he walked through that. He fought against it. He endured it. He defeated it. Because Hell had control over people. An interesting passage talks about in hell's sight, they look as, at us as nothing or as a nobody. It's like, they don't care. They don't want us to be happy. They, they think of us as no one. But the Lord, it says, came so that we might become somebody, that we might be something. So think about that in relation to the Lord's love. How much of his love do I have in myself? Am I willing to do similar things for others? What cause are you willing to give yourself up to support? I'm not talking about with your life, but maybe giving up some of your comfort or your wealth or your time. Or think about if you're married or in a relationship, what are you willing to give up from being me so that you can become us? What selfishness am I willing to lay down so that this relationship can be about us rather than just what I want? Or if you have children, we give up many freedoms so that they might have joy, that they might have life, so that they may experience things that you hope for them, good things, maybe things you didn't have for yourself. Think about the prophets, too, in the story. There's lots of prophets saying things about how the Lord would come. There's promises that things would get better. Because the Old Testament is full of these ideas. People are walking in darkness. Things are very bleak, very bad. But can we, like the prophets in those hopeless moments, be willing to stand up and speak a word of hope? And think about the prophets. Not really, maybe not even feeling it, maybe not even believing it, but they're doing it because they've been told it's right and keeping positive and looking for what's good and trusting that if the Lord said something is true, that it's actually true. And trying to figure out if I don't understand it, well, how can I maybe figure this out? And trusting that the Lord is there watching over us, grieving with us in our sadness and rejoicing with us in our gladness. So we can we be like the prophets who stand up for what's good and true and give voice for those who may not have a voice or those who might be marginalized or who may be hurt? Are we willing to give voice to hope? I think about also Zechariah and Elizabeth. Zacharias and it says about them they were patient and steadfast. Love is patient. Love is persistent. They served diligently in the temple and they wanted to have a child for themselves, but they didn't have a child. But they kept serving. They kept doing the right thing. Maybe wishing things were a little bit different than they were, wishing they had their own, their own child. But they didn't get bitter about it which I think sometimes when we don't get what we want, we can be bitter about it. But it said, they were both righteous before God, walking in the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Think about maybe a single parent carrying that full load of taking care of the children day after day by him or herself. 
The work has to be done, and they might wish it was different, but they keep doing it and doing what they have to do day after day. Or maybe working a job you don't even like, but you know your family needs money, you know you've got to do what you've got to do, and you do it with integrity. Or keeping the commandments, even though it feels easier to just let it go and say, well, let it slip. Maybe give in to lower impulses and say, it's fine, it'll be okay. (laughs) But standing firm in those things and knowing that eventually it pays off because a deeper type of happiness comes, a deeper freedom comes. And a child eventually was born to Zacharias and Elizabeth. It was John the Baptist, one who would prepare the way for the Lord. And he symbolizes in these teachings of repentance and how what comes before that birth of love in our life, pictured by the Lord, is that we have to repent. We have to look at our lives, examine what's going on with ourselves, see what our faults are and admit them, recognize them, know we have them, pray for help from the Lord to change those and then begin to live differently. Trying to do that. Because when we do that, it changes our life. When we're willing to make up our mind that we're going to stop a certain behavior, eventually we will if we make up our mind to do that. And that's why John is born first. The first step of our spiritual life is that repentance. But it says about him, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest, for you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways to guard our feet into the way of peace. Think about Mary as well. She carried the Savior She carried within her that promise of new life, the promise of the Lord. She carried within her the love that the Lord represents. And it's a different type. And she pictures an affection for truth, a spiritual type of affection for truth. And the writings explain that this way. Spiritual affections for truth have eternal life and the uses of that life as their end. Those who are in those affections love truths because they are truths, thus apart from the world's glory, honors, and gain. And those who love truths apart from such things love the Lord, for the Lord is with us in the truths which are from good. And it's that attitude, loving what's true because it's true, with where the Lord can be born. See, we don't create love within ourselves. If we follow what the Lord says and do what he teaches in his word, the Lord can plant within us that love. We don't create it. Do the right thing and the love will show up. Think about it in terms of relationship. I think often people that lo- think that love is a feeling that we have for one another. And you know if you've been in a relationship long enough that that's really not what love is about. The feelings of love are wonderful when you feel warm and affectionate and you feel that that closeness but that's not what love is those are a byproduct of being a loving person when we commit to caring for the other person commit for being a person of integrity and doing the right thing that creates a vessel where the love can show up and be born and think about joseph as well joseph was betrothed to mary and when they were betrothed promised to be married she was found to be pregnant and you can imagine his heartache. And you can imagine his doubt. He's like, how, is, how did this happen? And he could have had her stoned to death because of this, but he didn't. He said he was a just man. He wanted to put her away secretly so her reputation wouldn't be harmed, so she wouldn't be harmed either physically. And when we can foster that attitude within ourselves of looking for the good in other people, not rushing to judgment on them, trying to figure out why people do what they do instead of assuming the worst about them. When we have a choice, what's the easiest thing to do versus what's the kind thing to do? Let's choose what's kind. Let's choose what's good. We don't have to punish people. I think evil brings its own punishment. We don't have to take it upon ourselves to find ways to punish people who we don't agree with. But how can we, like Joseph, step up and look for the good in somebody else and accept it when we hear about it? Then think about the shepherds. I love their story. It's a wonderful story representing innocence, a willingness to follow the Lord. 
But I want to focus just quickly on their response to the message that they heard. They gave the gift of sharing the good news that they heard. It says, Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. They told everyone about it. And that's one of the things that we can take on ourselves is Christmas is about sharing. It's about giving. It's not just about thinking about it, but about doing what's good. So to love other people, we share what we have. We share love. We share the positive messages. We share hope. And you never know what impact your smile is going to make on somebody else, your kind gesture, a simple thing of sharing a message of hope. So how can we widely share the blessings that the Lord gives us. And of course, there's the wise men. And this isn't just about, not about loving what's true, but seeking it out in your life. As they diligently searched for the Lord, searched for the star that would lead them to him. What is wisdom anyway? We think about that with the wise men. It's not just about knowing stuff, it's about having to apply it in life. And here's the passage that I love about this. It says, By the capacity to be wise is not meant the capacity to reason about truths and goods from memory knowledges. So it's not about that kind of thing. Nor the capacity to confirm whatever one pleases. But the capacity to discern what is good and true. To choose what is suitable. And to apply it to the uses of life. They who ascribe all things to the Lord do thus discern, choose, and apply. So wisdom isn't about knowledge. It's about living what you know to be true, making wise choices, not just going, oh, that's a beautiful star up in the heavens. That's really neat. But following it to where it's leading us. Another aspect of their story is part of wisdom is knowing what not to do. They were told not to go back to Herod. Herod pictures our ego or self-interest, and we can't go back to that way of living. Once you know the difference between following the Lord, doing what's right, you can't go back that way. It will kill the new life that is being born. So we need to go another way. Christmas time also, we think about John 1, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. How do we embody the message of Christmas? How do we do the same thing? How does the Word become flesh and dwell in us? How can I make manifest the love that the Lord has shown me and is showing me in his word? How do I put flesh on these truths and make them living and real? So this sermon is a question for us. What part can we play to encourage the love and the light to come in the world? How will you contribute? What part will you play? You don't have to change the world. But if we change our attitude, the world might look a lot different and that there might be peace and there might be goodwill on earth. Amen. Can you bow your heads with me for a prayer? Lord, as we enter more fully into the Christmas season, help us to find ways to let your light shine, let your love pour out of us. Help us to embody the message of Christmas in all the different ways it shows up. Help us ask ourselves, how will we contribute? How will we give? How will we share? And find a way and live it. Amen. Now open up the floor if you have any prayer requests that you would like to ask or someone you're thinking about for yourself or anybody else, and we'll have a minute of silent prayer following. Margaret, yes, go ahead. What's his name? Bob, thank you. Thanks, Margaret. Prayers for all the firefighters in California and those obviously in a very difficult situation. Thank you. And for your brother, Bob. Anybody else? Yes. Thank you. 
as they may find work. Thank you. Caleb. Those who are, might be alone or may not have that kind of support. Thank you, Caleb. Anyone else? All right, let's have a minute of silent prayer. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from him who is and who was and who is to come. Amen. Let you just stand, please. Please remain standing to sing O Holy Night on page 24.
Oxford are in your handout. It's called It's in Every One of Us. It's two verses. The band is going to sing it through once, and then we invite you to join in and sing in us with us a second time. coming today. Appreciate your presence. And um, if you have any questions or comments or things you'd like to say, we have time for that. And I uh, invite you to talk into a mic so those online can hear you and others as well. Anybody? Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Well, you talked about Christmas, Dave. And um, I certainly think the Christmas season can be hard. Um, people have fear, and they're lonely. There's joy. There's so many things. 
But I think the biggest thing that we've learned in the last year is it really is about relationship and connection and connection with each other. You know, um, I haven't been here to the new church for about a year um, due to a, some things, but um, I feel connected to each and every one of you. And when I come to church, I'm always welcomed. Um, I welcome people back. So I think it, it's in this world of chaos, I would say at this point, is really reaching out and building relationship and feeling connected. So I hope for everyone this Christmas season, as you said, a smile. Someone may be having a bad day just to stay connected. Thanks, Mary. Anybody else behind you? Selena? <laughs> So I, I had two things. So one, one of the reasons I struggle with Christmas is that there is so much emphasis on being kind and doing good things and sharing. And it seems like everybody does that. And then it's January and nobody does it. And I feel like that's one of the things I struggle with because it's hard for me because it feels like a manufactured kindness simply because it doesn't last. I feel like a lot of the time it's not like make these changes so that they can be permanent changes, but make these changes for Christmas. And I, I've just always really struggled with that since I was a teenager and really started noticing it. And, I, you know, you see ads and it's like if people did half of the things that they do for other people at Christmas the rest of the year, just think how wonderful the world would be. And this community isn't as is definitely wonderful year round. <laughs> so I'm not like emphasizing that here, but I noticed that as my kids aged, they would say things like that too. Um, and I'm sure part of it was me. And then, so that's one of the things I've always struggled with yeah. around Christmas time. And then a second thing I wanted to say was you were talking about doing the right thing and how, you know, it's not always easy and, um, we always say in my family, the, the right thing is always the simple thing to do, which doesn't make it easy. It could be the hardest thing in the world, but it's always the most simple. So yeah. I just wanted to throw both of those thoughts Thank out you. there. Yep. Thanks, Felita. Uh, one quick response. If anyone else has something to say as well, please do. Um, I think one of the things that is good about Christmas is that people do acts of kindness, right? But And like you say, they don't always continue that. But I think even if it's once a year where people are reminded, oh, this is a good thing to do, to be nice, to be generous, then I think it does start to infect you in the good sense of the word <laughs> um, more deeply and it becomes more of your way of life rather than a one once a year activity. So I hear what you're saying and I think that it can certainly make one cynical, but I think it does have a way of of spreading slowly within our DNA, I think, as we, we do that. So thank you. Anyone else have anything? Care? Um, the one thought I had to that idea is that resonates with me, but I also had the thought of we don't plant seeds all year long mm -hmm. and we don't harvest crops all year long. That there, I think there's a seasonal inhale and exhale and that per there is parts of that that I think that it's appropriate to focus on it for a time and then let it be something else at another time. Um, I found myself struck today by that the verbs of the story are simple. They're share, spread, apply, follow. They're not fix, solve, fight, protect. Hmm. And they're not head verbs. They're just, they're more heart verbs. Hmm. And that, I don't know, I think that's the message I need to be hearing. Thanks, Karen for drawing that out. Appreciate that. And I really like what you said, too, about planting seeds. That's pretty, pretty cool. You are a wise man. Anything else? All right. Well, the kids are setting something up for us. They have their little program, so I don't know who's going to tell them that. But why that's happening, a couple announcements we can share. Um, if you are here for the first time or just want to update any information about your life or how you want to get involved or not get involved,